All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, we will try to do this together. This is the first time I'm going to do like a fully virtual chat. Let's see how it goes. Proactive versus reactive. Training versus response. Drills versus firefighting. We're so used to thinking of these as diametrically opposed concepts. So a proactive approach focuses on eliminating the problems before they've had a chance to appear. And a reapproach focuses on responding to such events after they have happened. Seems like a very natural way to categorize our strategies and actions. And we also apply this mindset of proactive versus reactive to information security. When I joined the Netflix security team three years ago, I had come from a more traditional approach of the proactive versus reactive lens on security functions. So the more hybrid approach at Netflix was new to me and a bit surprising. But in practice, I found that it worked a lot more efficiently and presented better collaboration opportunities across all the teams. And in this talk today, I will cover why traditional security functions end up being organized around this proactive versus reactive model. I will share more details about what a more hybrid incident response model looks like for us at Netflix. And I will share some of our team learning and program benefits that come from this hybrid model. Folks may be familiar with the NIST cybersecurity framework. It is a policy framework that any organization, big or small, can use to evaluate their current security program. And that's a pretty flexible way. So it helps you identify areas where existing processes may need to be strengthened, or areas where new processes may need to be implemented to improve your program maturity. And it gives us a very good common language and methodology to be able to manage and understand our security risk and to be able to communicate it to different stakeholders. Now, at its core, there are five functions in the NIST CSF. Identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. These functions are the primary pillars of a successful and holistic information security program. And there it is, protect and respond, the proactive and reactive pieces of a holistic successful security program, according to NIST. Now let's dive a little bit deeper. The PROTECT function focuses on development and implementation of appropriate safeguards to ensure the delivery of critical infrastructure services. So it supports the ability to limit or contain the impact of a potential security incident. So this would include things like identity management, access control enforcement, data security, security reviews and threat models, things that a lot of companies would classify as product security. Now, please take a moment and jot down two skills that you think make a product security engineer successful at their job. I will wait. And hold on to that, and we will come back to it in a little bit. Now, the primary goal of a product security team is to ensure that your organization is building secure products. And the way we do this is by providing foundational security services like OFM, OTZ, uh, by working closely with engineering stakeholders on security initiatives, by conducting security reviews on new products that are being built, by identifying and remediating security vulnerabilities. So really putting safeguards in place that limit the impact of a potential security incident. So when I thought about the core skills that are important to be successful in this role, I thought of things like deep technical domain expertise in your product area. Now that could be AppSec or system security or security software engineering. Skills in threat modeling and security architecture. The ability to manage stakeholder relationships so you can collaborate on big cross-functional projects. 
On the other hand is the respond function. Here the focus is on development and implementation of appropriate activities to take action regarding a detected security incident. So you focus on the ability to contain the impact of a potential security incident. So this would include things like response planning on how to handle a potential incident, coordination and communication of response activities, mitigation and resolution of an incident in a timely manner and according to impact. And this is what most incident response teams do. Now, again, take a moment and jot down two skills that you think make an incident responder successful at their job. All right, we will come back to that soon. Now, the goal of the incident response team is really to make sure that an organization is well prepared to respond to any security events, that you have built strong capabilities and procedures to navigate these situations. So when I thought about the core skills that are needed here, I thought of things like a breadth focused security domain expertise. So you're able to handle different types of security incidents. You need the ability to navigate ambiguity. You need a flexible approach to risk, good judgment, high integrity, clear communication. You need to respect the lever of criticality. So you know when to spin up an incident on a Friday night. Not everything is going to be a high severity event. And you need to make sure that you're level setting expectations appropriately for your stakeholders. Now, let's go back to the lists of skills that we wrote. Um, so I don't know about you, but I think I came up with a very different set of core skills that are needed for a product security engineer versus an incident responder. So it makes sense to hire different folks into these roles because they're really bringing different expertise to the table. And frameworks like the NIST CSF also translate into how we structure our security organizations. CISOs often think of their security programs in terms of the functions that they're providing. And organizing by function can provide a lack of complexity, and it seems like a logical way to rationalize the services that you're providing. So this mindset of proactive versus reactive security makes logical sense to structure around. But is that really the best way? Like we just said, there are obviously very different set of skills that are needed for product security versus incident response. But in practice, this model can lead to context silos between the two functions or increased response time when you're managing triage, verification, and remediation across separate teams. Imagine there was a P0 issue in a Java library that's widely used in your engineering ecosystem. You obviously want to make sure that you systematically drive that to remediation and make sure there is no indicators of compromise, make sure that all critical systems are updated. Now, in this model, if ProtSec world scanning tooling found the issue, then ProtSec would go page CERT to spin up an incident. CERT would loop them back in because they need ProtSec to participate in the incident because ProtSec is the subject matter expert on this. Now, CERT is managing the incident with engineering nurse who are actually closer to ProtSec in terms of relationships. And CERT would have to rely heavily on ProtSec folks throughout the resolution process. So if you think of it in this scenario, you're probably waking CERT in the middle of the night for no reason at all. And today, I'm going to make a case for the fact that modern security teams should embrace more hybrid models for protect and respond as it makes sense for their organizations. Because otherwise, there is important left at the table when you keep your proactive and reactive security functions entirely separate. So here is what our model looks like over at Netflix. Our security incident response team or the CERT team is our primary incident response function. This is also what a lot of companies call CSERT. So they're responsible for managing incidents that impact our users, our systems, our infrastructure, 
Um, they are also responsible for out incident management processes and tooling. Some of you may have heard of Dispatch, which is our incident management platform. And it provides us a centralized way to manage incident activities. So things like creating resources, assembling participants, sending out notifications, scheduling post-incident reviews, really all of the administrivia that goes with running an incident. Now, our product security team handles what we call PCERT. PCERT, or the product security incident response function, identifies, evaluates, and coordinates responses to the security vulnerabilities in the products that we build and in our engineering ecosystem. And we handle this responsibility as a part of our team on call. Now, outside of this PCERT function, we largely have a pretty proactive security charter. So focusing on things like security guidance, engineering partnerships, vulnerability identification, security self-service, all of that stuff. Now, in this model, ProtSec still gets to leverage all of the great tooling and processes that are built by CERT, but we serve as a little outpost of first responders that respond to uh, product and engineering related incidents. Now, I wanna share a little bit more detail about how we at Netflix define a security incident because different organizations use this term very differently. So when I say security incident, I don't mean the same thing as what Colleen meant when she said security incident yesterday. For us, a security incident is a potential developing or current security problem that needs some level of coordinated effort to investigate and resolve with some level of urgency. We assign priorities to incidents based on the potential impact to our systems, our business, or our customers. So for example, if heart bleed happened tomorrow, we would spin up an incident to coordinate our response to it. So this incident is spun up even for events that have a potential impact. And the investigation for indicators of compromise is a part of that incident process. The goal here is to make sure that we can use the incident framework to coordinate our mitigation and response efforts and address the potential risk to the company. Now, whenever an incident is created, we assign an incident commander for that incident. Their job is to maintain overall incident context, direct the discussions, solicit ideas and approaches from the subject matter experts or the SMEs that are involved, but the incident commander is ultimately responsible for choosing the course of action we take. So they obviously rely heavily on the capabilities of the SMEs that are present, but at the end of the day, the incident commander is responsible for driving the incident to closure. So if you thought it, they're really the 11 of that group. Now here is where the core skills of an incident responder come into play. Judgment, integrity, communication, situational awareness. So for a incident, a P0 vulnerability in the VPN that we use, the CERT team would be the incident commander. They would handle the incident end-to-end, -end, assembling the right participants as needed, driving things to resolution. And a piece of end could spin up from, say, the bug bounty or vulnerability scanning tools or a threat intel alert about an in the wild exploitation for a certain product that we use uh, in our engineering ecosystem. So for example, a researcher finds a P0 or there is the next Apache struts, those cases, ProtSec would be incident commander, and they would use all of the CERT tooling and processes, but CERT does not need to get involved for every incident. In this case, the CERT team can reserve the bandwidth for incidents that are truly best handled by CERTs. So maybe an employee investigation or something. As we will dig deeper in the rest of this presentation, this model allows each team to leverage their unique strengths to drive towards better overall outcomes. Now, what makes this distributed model successful for us? Using common processes, runbooks, and incident commander trainings really helps folks get onboarded to this distributed model. 
Because like me, there is a lot of other folks on the ProTech team that came from ProTech teams that didn't do incident response. Using the same dispatch tooling for all incident types really helps reduce the cognitive load during an incident. And it brings a lot of consistency to what the incident process looks like, no matter who the incident commander is. And having a clear understanding of roles and responsibilities and transparency in incident context makes the collaboration a lot easier. And most important of all, giving the incident commander end-to-end -end ownership for resolution empowers them to drive decisions while considering the situation and input from all of the SMEs that are involved. So let's see what this looks like from the point of everybody that is involved because we're striving for a consistent experience for all of our stakeholders, internal and external. For the bug bounty researcher who submitted AP0 to our program and found something really bad in one of our services, they continue this with the project engineer that they're used to working with. For all the stakeholders that are in engineering or across the enterprise, they have a pretty consistent experience when interacting with our incident management tooling. So let's say legal doesn't really need to know if the incident originated from bug bounty or from somewhere else. They just get called into an incident Slack channel. They know that they're working an incident with, with the security team. They don't need to care who the incident commander is. And in this model, ProtSec can continue focusing, building relationships with their product engineering customers. And CERT maintains the relationships across the enterprise with various stakeholders. So let's say if comms needs to get involved in a PCERT incident, they already have the right context on what it means to participate in a security incident. So what does the product security team bring to the table in this model? The biggest one really is the context from the engineering ecosystem. ProTech can leverage their domain expertise to guide the resolution appropriately. For example, figuring out what to prioritize when you're remediating an issue that affects all internet-facing services, or knowing the usage context of a particular technology stack in our ecosystem, or which team to reach out to when you're fixing a platform level issue, or even what the right way to fix an issue may be. They may also have deeper context on the use cases and business logic for certain impacted applications that can guide resolution. And they can also lend their expertise to determine severity and impact of an issue to make sure that we're level setting correctly for what is truly high severity. And this makes the experience more efficient for everybody that is involved. Another important advantage is faster resolution time. Prot's able to handle the incidents end to end when it initiates from sources that are closest to them. So the bug bounty or language dependency scanning or platform vulnerabilities or other critical severity issues that may have come from pen testing. There is really no additional time overhead for handoff between triage, verification, and remediation. So for the example that we talked about earlier with the Java P0, we can get to, get to resolution a lot quicker without waking up a bunch of additional folks in the middle of the night. And when it comes to issues that originated from the bug bounty, ProtSec has continued context on specific researchers. They know the type of issues they have submitted, the potential escalations with any of them that may have happened in the past. And all of this can be very crucial context when you're handling high severity issues. And in this model, ProTech handles both the researcher interaction and the internal resolution, and they have more visibility and ownership for the whole process, trying to get things to resolution. And serving as incident commanders, we can also provide firsthand feedback on incident management tools like Dispatch that are built by the CERT team. This helps us improve the experience for all incident participants. In fact, we can also experience firsthand feedback about tools that we build as the ProTSec team. So for example, our team builds the asset inventory product and we use it as a data source during incident response. 
This gives us an opportunity to get direct feedback about data quality and usability issues uh, in the asset inventory product. Actually, fun fact, we realized the need for an asset inventory because of our role as PSERT responders. We realized that we were having to go to multiple data sources to gather all the information that we needed in the middle of an incident. And obviously now that tool is an important part of our arsenal because we use it for a lot of other use cases as well, but really the need emerged from the incident response use cases. So what have we learned as a product security team that runs incidents? As I mentioned before, crisis management is a core skill that incident responders need to have. And that's not something that we interview for or really try to build as ProtSec engineers. But running incidents helps the ProtSec team build these skills. Showing good judgment under pressure, de-escalating situations, gauging severity and potential impact, communicating incident information with stakeholders and leadership with a high level of integrity. Taking on incident commander responsibilities really helps us get better at these skills. And these skills actually make us better security engineers. And in addition to individual skills, working incidents also makes us a more resilient team. An incident commander takes on ownership for resolving a pretty high stakes situation. And to be able to do this successfully, you need an environment of trust, honest communication, teamwork, and the ability to improvise and use your best judgment in the face of uncertainty. These are things that make us more resilient as a team. Is incidents also give the ProtSec team a direct view into whether certain proactive security controls are effective. Post-incident reviews also serve as a way for us to identify process gaps and capability gaps that we may have. And it gives us opportunities to continually test our strategy bets and evolve our approaches based on those learnings. In this way, it creates a culture of continuous learning and improvement on the ProtSec team. Raise your hand if your customer teams have ever said to you, but you don't understand. It's okay, it's just you in your living room or your office, no one will know. That has definitely happened to me before. Working an incident together, the ProtSec team is in the trenches with their engineering counterparts. You're searching through log sources together, you're doing investigations using observability and reliability tools that the engineering teams use. And this closer collaboration really helps us extend their tools, their processes, their pain points firsthand. It makes us a better, more empathetic security partner to them. And working together on this builds more trust and strengthens our relationship with those partner teams. Over the past few years, we as an industry have acknowledged and tried to address the stereotype of the security team that throws requirements over the fence at engineering. An incident response gives us a very concrete opportunity to practice being the security team that shows up for their customers as an equal and invested partner in a high stakes situation. Incident response also helps us strengthen our product security program. Incident trends can be a strong indicator for the overall security posture of a particular organization. In fact, we report on incident trends as a part of quarterly partnership updates that we send to our engineering stakeholders. So the goal for these quarterly updates is to help engineering leaders see the current state of their security initiatives. So what are we working on with them and why? What is the risk we're trying to reduce? What's going well? What needs leadership support? So bringing incident trend data into this forum makes that a part of the picture that we are presenting to those leaders. It shows them 
trends around what kinds of incidents are happening, frequency of how often, level of severity. We're also starting to experiment with cost analysis for these incidents. This would give us an indication of how much it costs to handle some of these things and which teams have to get involved to respond to something. The engineering leaders are then able to see a more complete picture of their security posture and their future investment needs. So for example, if you're seeing multiple incidents that are related to sensitive information ending up in logs, then cleaning up the data spilled each time is an okay remediation for that particular incident. But what you should really invest in is log wrapper lives or continuous data detection for those log sources. And it doesn't always have to be engineering improvements that come out of this too, or that solve the problem you're facing. So if you've invested a ton of effort in authentication and authorization controls for applications that are used by, say, contractors in your ecosystem, but you're seeing incidents that are related to access issues because those folks were not offboarded appropriately, then the missing investment is actually in identity lifecycle management and not in building those controls. And now if you see the same set of applications have, say, authorization-related issues from the bug bounty, then you can make a case for proactive investment in those authorization controls as opposed to the one-off fixes. And you can help make a stronger case for that investment from engineering because your incident cost data can complement all of the other context that you have about those security investments. And it can serve as an input in determining whether to make the investment or not. So if we handled five incidents, all related to the same root cause of this authorization issue, and it, I don't know, cost us about $40,000 to handle each of them, you can now put a dollar value on the impact of prioritizing the proactive control that would address that issue. In the binary proactive versus reactive model, Pratsec is advising on the priority of security initiatives, but somewhat in incomplete context. Yes, we can get some additional data using attack tree exercises or red team assessments, but incident insights really help us assess our existing investments or help us identify new opportunities for holistic security improvements. So for example, did our workload isolation strategy really limit the impact of a potential RCE and change our response strategy uh, for an issue? A couple of years ago, based on a PCERT incident, we realized that it was too easy to misconfigure an internet-facing application in our environment. And the guidance that we provided for folks putting their apps internet facing really depended on how cynical your security person was feeling that day. And some of it was fixing simple things too, like default app config for auto redirect from HTTP to HTTPS or default logging and retention windows. We also kicked off a couple of initiatives or learnings from this one. Standardizing the baseline of security control internet facing applications, finding more opportunities for secure by default in our engineering tools. And these initiatives have become very important parts of our product security strategy. The good news is that the ProtSec team already has close relationships with the engineering stakeholders. So when you figure out what those long-term initiatives need to be that emerge from incident findings, you can drive those with those project relationships and you can prioritize them against other work that you are trying to get done with those same customers. Another area of incremental value with project doing PCERT is representing incident response needs in product roadmaps. Project engineers work closely with the teams that are building internal as well as customer facing products. So for example, the security engineer who partners with the team that builds our secure authentication proxy now also does PCERT. So when they think about secure by default controls that need to be present in the authentication proxy, they don't just think about authentication or mutual TLS. They are also thinking about things like an emergency block list for incident response use cases or default request logging based on what you need for common incident use cases. And this helps us build better secure by default products 
that are looking at both proactive and reactive security needs. Another area where we're trying to do this better is in our self-service security product. So the goal for that is really to help engineers see a single view of all security actions that they need to take. Now that could be open vulnerabilities, that could be outdated libraries, it could be missing security controls, but now they can also see things like, oh, this app has insufficient logging and you should go fix that because that will potentially be a problem or you're missing on-call information for a particular application. So we're not gonna know who to page or post-incident action items that came out of an incident after it was closed as long-term fixes. Now they can see all of that context in one place in addition to what we call kind of like the product security action items. And in this model, incident context becomes a primary consideration in our proactive security strategy. The biggest takeaway that I want you to walk away with today is that doing incident response makes us better product security engineers. It creates a continuous feedback loop to assess and improve our security investments. It leads to better resolution and remediation of issues. It helps us build crucial crisis management skills, and it makes us a more empathetic and resilient team. This model was new to me when I came to Netflix, but it has been a great learning experience to see the other side of the coin and to be able to share those learnings with you all today. Asa for that talk um, and just for everybody again we were just starting day two of Locomoco set we're using Slido for questions uh, first question here because uh, you, you talk a lot about you know that connection between incident response and then how that influences product security and so um, and specifically as we get to like the long-term remediations but how do we how do you catalog that that those long term remediations? Is it like a in the moment at like after action report? But how does that get cataloged there? Uh, so our cert team had like a post incident review that happens after everything is closed out, and then the appsec person that is a part of the incident, uh, in terms of the response, really kind of takes the action item of converting the long-standing items into JIRA tickets, which is what we use for long-term tracking for other vulnerabilities and things like that. And then the goal is really to have that just be one other thing that they have to do, same, same as you know something we found from Appendus or somewhere else. Okay. Yeah, because I, I mean, I've, I've found that that part is extremely important to you know provide some level of assurance that all findings kind of receive some level of, of treatment there. And then um, I know that the, the focus of this talk is around, you know, incident response and product security, but then um, how do you then share this information with, um, you know, either your pen testing teams, either your risk teams, um, some of the network security, like what, what, are, what, what processes do you guys currently have for that and share that information in that way? For sharing the information, I, I guess one of the things that we are trying to kind of do more of that is still pretty early is this concept of quantified risk. And one of the things there that we're trying is really, oh, trying to come up with risk scores for particular applications and entities and using previous incident data as an input in that risk score to say, oh, okay, you know, like these are the types of issues that have happened. And then that impacts the risk score of that particular application or entity. So that's one thing that we're trying in terms of like, how does that become a contact, uh, like a part of the risk context? Okay. And, and as we're talking about quantification there, you touch on um, trends and insights, which is extremely important. And what, what, what have you found to be the most compelling metric or story when communicating what you guys are measuring when it comes to incidents? Yeah, I would say um, severity and volume um, and uh, being able to now, hopefully incident cost will be an interesting one to say that it's like, okay, now I can convert that severity, frequency and volume into a dollar number. Uh, so we're still pretty early on that journey of kind of the incident cost, but I think that that will be uh, an interesting one to see how it like helps change behavior because now you're, you can like compare dollars to dollars in terms of the investment. 
Absolutely. And, and, and that, that cost piece and the effectiveness there. And then it, it sounds like you guys are going to get to a place where by team or by engineering, you guys can tell that story. Um, so Asta, thank you very much uh, for the time and uh, aloha, mahalo, and please take care of yourself. We hope to have you at a you know future in-person Locomoco sec. But until then, talk to you later. Yeah, looking forward to it. Thank you very much.